Hello. We're in the last chapter now of James Orr, Sidelights on Christian Doctrine, and the last chapter, suitably, is Eternity and Its Issues, Advent and Judgment. I am to speak in this last study on the future, on which we have the light of prophecy shining as in a dark place, so says 2 Peter 1.19, to guide us, but regarding which there are still many things on which Christian people differ and are perplexed. I shall not, shall not enter into these minuter points of difference, but keeping to the plan I have been following will deal with those great outstanding truths that seem to belong to the essence of the Christian faith. Now, it's interesting that he should say this at this point. This is one of his last books, written just, just before the advent of World War I, when, of course, there were a tremendous number of books on the market. And if you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness, you know that you're your guidance was coming from that period. You, the faithful and discreet slave Charles Taze Russell was on the scene and then he was dead not long after this book came out. So beyond the Russellism though, there were a plethora of books, many of which were very good, but many of which were very misleading on the issues that James Orr is referring to here, the light that they thought they had on prophecy, which was often just as mistaken as that light that the cults pretended to have. But Orr goes on, the issues of redemption are in eternity and are connected in scripture with the Lord's parousia, or second coming. To this subject, therefore, I first direct attention. It is disputed by hardly any that our Lord did predict his personal return in glory to judge the world and bring in his everlasting kingdom. Or that, that is, was disputed that this was a fixed article of belief in the apostolic age. What is said in criticism of the belief is that the mere effluxion of time, as Professor Huxley put it in one of his essays, has demonstrated it to be a prodigious error. The critics do not doubt that this coming was predicted and looked for, but they remind us that nearly 1900 years have gone by and Christ has not come yet. Therefore, these beliefs and hopes of the early Christians are proved by events to have been a mistake. There were in Peter's time already those who asked, Where is the promise of his coming? For from the day that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. 2 Peter 3 verse 4 Now the fact on which these objectors base must be acknowledged, that is, that well nigh 1900 years have gone by, and Jesus has not returned yet in personal glory. The declarations in the New Testament that the Lord is at hand and all the other statements that seem to look for the near coming of the Lord have to face this fact and in some way be reconciled with it if the hope is not to be given up. My own attitude is that of faith in the personal, the final personal return of Christ. But the fact remains that this long interval has elapsed since the promises were given and it may fairly be asked if nearly 2,000 years have already elapsed, why not 3,000 or more? In seeking a solution of this problem, helpful light may be obtained by keeping in view some of the features of Old Testament prophecy of the appearing of the approaching rather day of the Lord. For in the Old Testament also you have a steady outlook on a great consummating day of the world's history. All through prophecy there is this day of the Lord looming up as in the background of a particular crisis in which the nation was at that time involved, such as the Assyrian. Babylonian and Maccabean crises. You have it depicted as the goal to which all events in time are moving on. Whatever obscurity may rest on the steps by which the end is to be reached, there is no dubiety that is doubt felt about the end itself. God's purpose shall be accomplished. His kingdom shall triumph. Whatever opposes itself to that and resists it shall be shattered and destroyed. By observing the principles which regulate Old Testament prophecy on this subject, we gain a clue to some of the difficulties in the predictions of the Lord's coming. One or two remarks are necessary at the outset to set the subject in its proper perspective. First, I do not think we can, in the light of the New Testament, affirm that it was given to the apostles or to the church to know the precise time of the Lord's return or the interval that would elapse in the Father's councils before that event would take place. The fact itself they knew, but it was not 
the time was not given to them. It was definitely withheld from them to know when the event should be. There can be no doubt about this because it is clearly stated. It is not for you, Jesus says to the disciples, to know times or seasons which the Father hath set within his own authority. Acts 1 7. And there is that far stronger passage to which I formerly referred, in which Jesus says, But of that day or that hour knoweth no one, not even the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Mark 13.32 Compare that with Matthew 24.36 and all of Revelation 5. The Son himself did not know. The second thing, is that it is far from clear that Jesus predicted or that the apostles believed that the advent would necessarily be in that generation or in quite so short a time as is sometimes imagined. I do not mean that the apostles postponed the coming in their thoughts to a far distant time, but I mean that there are many things in the sayings of Jesus, many things in the parables, many things in the epistles, and many things in the book of Revelation which point to a somewhat prolonged development. Jesus speaks, for example, of a period of delay which would try the faith and patience of his servants. In texts such as Matthew 25, verses 5 and 19, Luke 18, and verses 7 and 8, and 19, verse 11, in the subsequent verses. We'll put the list of these texts in the description. Of manifold persecutions, he speaks, when his disciples would be brought before governors and kings of the Gentiles, Matthew 10, 18, or of a secret growth of his kingdom, Mark 4, 26 to 28, and a gradual ripening of good and evil in the world till the final harvest, the famous parables of Matthew 13, 39, specifically verses 30, 39 to 42 of a protracted interval filled with world-shaking events during which the love of many would grow cold, that being Matthew 24, verses 12 and 13. He speaks of a worldwide evangelization, of a preaching of the gospel to every creature of disciples gathered from all nations, according to Matthew 24, 14, and Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Paul, in like manner, when the Thessalonians thought that the Lord's coming was just at hand, writes to them in his second epistle to warn them not to be shaken in mind as if that day was immediately impending. That's 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. And goes on to tell them that that day would not come till there had been a great apostasy and the man of sin had been revealed. Even then, apparently, would not come until that which was hindering. That is, he puts in the bracket, question mark, the Roman Empire. And that's, by the way, a very common interpretation of that passage among the more standard commentaries. The, the Roman Empire was that which was hindering or restraining the coming great apostasy and the coming of Antichrist. And that, according to the same chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2, that restraint or hindering had to be taken out of the way. And again, in Romans 11, he sketches on a large scale a kind of philosophy of history in which events are mentioned as the ingathering of the Gentiles and the conversion of Israel consequent on that. That is Romans 11, 25 to 32, which necessarily must consume much time. It could not be supposed by anyone reflecting on the subject that a month or a year or many years would suffice to cover all these events. Yet no one, I think, would have been more surprised than Paul or any of these early Christians. Their hearts would have almost have sunk within them if they had been informed that Christian people in the 20th century would still be discussing the question as to when the Lord was to appear, indeed. But I, I think the, uh, the restraint of or, um, and by the way, this is typical of the great theologians of the church and commentators, the restraint of or in this period when hundreds of books were coming out on prophecy going to going to extremes and going out on limbs in terms of prophetic application the restraint of war and the standard commentaries of the period is remarkable it's something we remarked upon or i remarked upon in collecting books on prophecy these guys generally are very cautious when it comes to future prophecy so james or goes on in the next uh, section to discuss time, more about time 
and the Lord's coming. I want to link on your screen F.F. F. Bruce, a hard saying of Jesus, this generation shall not pass away. And also, the parousia, what does it mean? What were the commentaries at this very time when James Orr wrote these things? And before, what were they saying about, about the meaning of the parousia? James Orr very evidently believes it's a visible coming. Was he in agreement with the commentaries and theologians of that time, and especially with the Greek scholars? That's also on your screen.